good morning, Graceway. Pastor John here. Want to let you know that I love you. I miss you. I'm praying for you and looking forward to being back in here on Sunday mornings with you as soon as we can. I have an important announcement for you today because Graceway has partnered with an organization by the name of Unite in Crisis so that we can feed families right here in our community. Starting today, families will be coming to Graceway to pick up food. If you need assistance or you'd like to be a part of that effort, you can go to their website at uniteincrisis.org. You know, right now it's hard for us to be connected to each other. Everyone's asked us to be in groups of 10 or less, to be at least six feet apart. And that's, that's a struggle. That's a struggle for me. It's a struggle for me and my small group. And what we've done is we've started using Sunday night Zoom calls to be able to connect to each other. And then we use texting throughout the week so we can keep up with prayer requests and continue to encourage each other. And I want that same thing for you. It's not too late to find a group. If you'd like to find a group here at Graceway, you can go to visitgraceway.org groups. Another way we want you to connect is on Easter. It's coming up soon. But before Easter, we have a Good Friday service at 6.30 p.m. online. And then on Easter Sunday, we have services at 9 and 10.30. So I'm so glad that you chose to attend online with us today. I want you to know I love you, I miss you, and hope that you find a comfortable seat and get ready for Pastor Tim's upcoming message. Hey, Graceway, Pastor Tim here, wanting to wish you a happy Palm Sunday. Thanks for continuing to connect with us in this way, this temporary normal that we're in the midst of. And I've heard from so many of you uh, just encouragement and uh, what God's saying to you and what God's doing in your life. Just again, want to tell you how proud I am of you and how thankful I am to God just for his faithfulness to us in this time. Uh, we're going to have a great time here this morning hearing from God and his word. You can't cancel church. I hope you know that. You are the church. And so hopefully you're sitting there. You are in your pajamas. You got your favorite cup of coffee. You got your arm around a loved one and you're ready to roll. Today is Palm Sunday, the beginning of what the church has for hundreds of years called Holy Week, leading up into the celebration of Jesus's resurrection Easter Sunday. And in Matthew 21, Jesus comes into Jerusalem uh, in a kind of subtle way, right? This victorious King of Kings and Lord of Lords comes in riding on a borrowed donkey. And the city goes crazy and welcomes him with worship and celebration and we know with the benefit of hindsight that a week later, uh, they are those who are uh, calling him Jesus and the Christ and the Messiah are calling for him to be crucified. And, uh, you know, before we judge the, the Hebrews too harshly, I, I've had times in my life where I've got this pent up pressure, this pent up circumstance that I'm living in. And the idea that God might be showing up can elicit some temporary, a, a burst of worship and praise. I think that's what we see on Palm Sunday. But I want to talk to you today about a worship and a faith that affects our everyday. We're going to finish up the book of James. We're not going to talk about bursts of worship. We're going to talk about worship that's that's challenged, that's under pressure, but that's faithful uh, Monday to Saturday, not just on our Sundays, not just on our holiday weekends, not just in the idea that God might do something abnormal, but just the normalcy of our worship and walk with God. And so we're going to finish up the book of James today. I want you to open up your Bible to James chapter 5 and verse 7. We're going to go to the end of the book. And this is going to be an incredibly, incredibly, incredibly practical word from God. Uh, Pastor James is, is, is done to a certain extent challenging the church, and he's going to give them some practicalities of how to live out their faith in the midst of suffering, in the midst of sickness, in the midst of pressure. Sound familiar? That's where we are right now. And so James chapter 5 and verse 7 through 12 is where we'll begin. And I want to talk to you today about patience and suffering and prayer and sickness. Here we go. James 5 and verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you might not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider them blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard about the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. 
But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you might not fall under condemnation. Patience and suffering. James is going to come to us, and he's not as much talking about just the, the bursts, the commitments that we make to God in the middle of, uh, of, of an especially unique and, and, and supernatural event. He's talking about across the long haul. How do we experience and grow in patience while we're under pressure? And he's going to give us three ways. He says, first, while you're suffering, while you're suffering, while you're in, uh, uh, needing to stay at home, while you're afraid you might have COVID, while you just lost your job, while you're afraid you're going to have more month and money. In the midst of that, have patience. Have patience. And because James knows that we misunderstand patience so many times, he's going to tell us how to, how to develop patience in our lives. The first is he says, I want you to do it like a farmer. Now, so few of us are farmers. I'm certainly not a farmer, but I do know this, that a farmer learns to accept that they can't control the outcome. A farmer learns to accept that, that I can't control whether or not it's going to rain, I'm going to get enough sun, I'm not going to be able to control how this harvest goes. But a, a farmer honors God by investing in what and what he can control. Uh, there are things in the midst of this season that we're in right now. Listen, this is the truth of it. You don't, you don't have much control. You don't have, we don't have control when we're going to be able to worship together. We don't have control whether or not we're going to be able to hang on to our jobs. We don't have control whether or not we're going to be able to stay healthy. Uh, and there are things that are created in that lack of control. James says, I want, you, I want you to acknowledge what you can control and leave the rest up to God. Just like a farmer who wakes up early in the morning, goes out, tends to the soil, plants good seed, does everything that they can to produce a favorable outcome, but they know that there are certain things that are entirely up to God. Can I tell you in the midst of this season, a way to develop patience is to know what is yours and to know what is God's. And be a good steward of what is yours. Be a good steward of getting up, spending time with God. Be a good steward of dealing with the issues that are happening in your heart and in your family and in your community. But also acknowledge that I'm not God, right? That there are things that I can't control and things that I can't do. And that when I acknowledge that I'm not God and there's only so much that I can do, I can be patient in God doing what he wants to do when he wants to do it. James says in the midst of suffering, you're going to try to bring this to a desired outcome on your timetable. You know what I'm talking about? I want to get out of this house right now, right? I want to get back to work right now. I want to be able to go to Starbucks right now, right? I want to be able to go out to eat. I want all of these things right now, but I don't have the control to do it. And the lack of control creates anxiety in us, which is the opposite of patience. And so James says, in the midst of this suffering, hey, be patient like a farmer. He goes on and he says, establish your hearts. That word establish means to fortify. That there are some things that you need to put between you and your circumstances, there are some things that you need to strengthen your heart that, that is in the in-between of, of your heart and, and, and the things that you're going through right now. So can I, can I tell you a couple of things you need to put in between your heart and your circumstance? You need to put the person of God. You need to put the promises of God. You need to put uh, God's word. You need to stay in touch with godly people. You need to fortify not just your outcomes in your brain. You need to fortify your heart in the midst of, of this season, the season of suffering and uncertainty and fear. Have patience, establish your hearts, and then be compassionate with one another. Can I get a good amen on this? My goodness, so many of you have not spent this much time with your family in your entire life, and you are looking for the back door. You're, you're saying, hey, maybe the corona's not that bad, right? Like, here, here, here's the thing that James says. He says, don't grumble against one another, brothers, so that you might not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. How many of you, you got some grumbling going on in your heart, in your life, in your house right now? How many of you are getting impatient? How many of you, your heart and your mind and your soul is being rocked right now by the abnormality of this season. James has a good word for us. Be patient like a farmer. Control only what you can control. Trust God with the rest. Put some things in between your heart and your circumstances, and then be compassionate with one another. The truth of it is that none of us are at our best right now. A lot of us are wearing our anxieties. We're wearing our fears. We're wearing our struggles. We're wearing 
wearing the reality of our beliefs. The, the things that I really think and that I really believe, are, are, are they show up under pressure. And so James says, hey, don't, don't grumble at each other. Don't, 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 don't be nasty to one another. Don't gossip to one another. Don't judge one another too harshly during this time. How many of you, you need a little extra grace in this season? How, how many of you know that when I'm not at my best, I don't need more criticism and more condescension? I, I need... I need grace. I need, I need compassion. Can I tell you, the people in your life right now, they need compassion from you. Yeah, the people that we go to church with, even if it's online, we need compassion for one another right now. We need to, to be more patient with one another, to pray for one another just a little bit extra, to be that person that stands between your friend's heart and their circumstance, to, to till the heart of one another's lives so that God can bring his full glory into our realities right now. And so James says, number one, in the midst of suffering, be patient. Number two, he wants us to persevere. James 5, 10 through 12, he gives us two examples. The first is of the prophets, and the second is of Job. The prophets are such an interesting example of perseverance because how many of you know that the prophets, not one of them, was successful by kind of fleshly and, and temporal judgment. Uh, every single one of them, their audience didn't listen to them. Every single one of them uh, came and said, God's going to judge if you don't do the opposite of what you're doing right now. And there were some of the prophets that God even said, here's the deal. I'm going to tell you to tell my people something, and they're not going to listen. How would you like that calling on your life? God says, you're going to do this thing, and it's not going to work. And yet I want you to do it. There's a, certain amount of, um, there's a certain amount of clarity that has to come with that. There's a certain amount of integrity that has to come with that. These prophets who persevered knowing that it wasn't working, how many would like to change your message at that point just to get one good amen, one come on somebody, one person to walk the aisle. But the prophets were, were set up to fail. That was God's plan in their life. But he required of them perseverance. He required of them perseverance. Listen, some of us right now, nobody that I know is excited about what's going on with COVID-19. Nobody that I know right now says, this is, this is wonderful. I'm, I hope that we get to do this every summer. But what does God require of us? He requires of us the clarity and the integrity to say, this is the season that God has us in. And we're going to persevere in the midst of it. We're going to be patient but we're also going to persevere. We're going to get up tomorrow morning and God's going to be God and I'm going to be faithful and I'm going to trust him anew and I'm going to ask him to give me my daily bread and, and take care of and protect those that I love. But I, I'm not going to quit in the midst of this suffering. And he talks about Job, that Job continued in the purposes of God, continued to hope in the purposes of God. You, you think about Job's life and everything that was going on. We don't get the sense that Job knew what was going on between God and Satan. Job only knew what he could see. Job only knew what he could feel. Job only knew what he was experiencing. And yet James says that, that Job held on to the purposes of God in the midst of his suffering. There's a certain amount of vision, right? A certain amount of belief, a certain amount of faith that comes with hopefulness. That in the midst of Job's life, in the midst of COVID-19, does God still have purposes? Yes, he does. What are they? I don't know what they all are right now, but I know that God's going to be faithful. And I know that God requires of us in the midst of it to persevere and, and to trust again and to believe again and to lean in again. And so James says, in the midst of suffering, be patient. In the midst of suffering, persevere. And in the midst of suffering, I want you to praise. You want us to praise? Are you crazy right now? We, we, there's no certainty. What, what would we praise about? James 5 and verse 13. I love this. If anyone is cheerful, let him sing praise. Well, I'm not cheerful, so I don't have to sing praise. Here's what James is getting at. Uh, you're going to have to choose joy in the midst of suffering. You're going to have to choose joy. I don't, I don't know if you know this about joy, but uh, joy doesn't always choose you. You're going to have to choose it. Joy uh, that, that you're waiting for the circumstance to line up so that you can feel a certain way, it, ain't, it isn't going to happen. And if you're waiting on joy to praise God, you're not going to do it. Uh, so here's the secret that I have for you. Um, if you'll choose joy, you'll be willing to praise. And when I'm willing to praise, it will produce joy. When, 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 I, when I choose joy, I get up in the morning, I say, this is the day that God has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it even though there's uncertainty, even though there's fears, even though there's anxieties and suffering. 
and things that I wish weren't happening. This is a day that God has made, and I'm going to get up tomorrow. I'm going to persevere. I'm going to be patient that it's another day that I'm at home. It's another day that the world is what the world is, and I'm going to choose to rejoice in this day. I'm going to choose to praise God in this day. In my experience, cheer follows praise, and praise produces cheer. And so some of you, the reason that you're struggling with anxiety and fear and and maybe depression is that you're looking at the wrong thing. You're looking at your circumstance instead instead of looking at God. Can I tell you that that there are circumstances that you can go through if you're looking at the right right thing? And so I want to encourage you in this season that we're in right now, this season of suffering and fear and anxiety, this season that for whatever reason, in the sovereignty of God, we, we are in to be patient, to continue to invest and plant good seed in your heart and in the hearts of those that you love and in the hearts of those that you care about, to persevere, to wake up each morning and say, this is the day that God's made. This is the day that God's faithful. This is the day that God has something for me, and I'm going to choose joy. I'm going to choose to praise. And so I, I'd encourage you as practically as I could to get up in the morning and put God first. Take that first 15 minutes and get your eyes off of your day and get your eyes off of your fears and get your eyes off of, in some cases, your reality and get them onto God and trust God and be patient in God's working, not only in our world, but in your heart. And take those 15 minutes and, and, and pray five, read five, and sing five. You want me to sing in my house? I do. I want you to sing in your house at the top of your lungs. Get some Get some good music on. We heard a new song today. This is my jam right now. Gardens to, or Graves to Gardens. And I've been listening to this thing on repeat. And I, I'm singing quite terribly at the top of my lungs listening to this song. We're trying to get new songs in front of you. Not just so you can say, oh, Pastor Brandon and the team's so good. No, because I want you to sing them. Because I want you to believe them. Because I want you to get your eyes off of your problems and on to praise so that you can you can see God differently, so you can hear God differently, so you can learn from God differently, so that you can grow in the midst of this. And so James, talking to a church that's suffering, talking to a church that's displaced and afraid and communication's bad, and he says, hey, be patient. God hasn't lost us. Hey, persevere. God's going to be faithful. Hey, continue to praise. Get your eyes off your problems Get your eyes on to Jesus. And then finally, he's going he's gonna to say something that, man, is incredibly, incredibly relevant to us right now. Uh, he says, if anyone is among you is suffering, James 5 and verse 13, let him pray. If anyone among you is suffering, wh- what is God's solution for that? Prayer is God's solution for that. And so l- let's talk about this idea of, of healing in the Bible. And let me, let me tell you that there are things about healing that I don't understand. There are things about healing that are mysterious to me, like uh, why does God heal some people and not heal other people? Why does God heal some people on the spot and other people through a doctor? Why does, why does it, uh, there doesn't seem to really be any rhyme or reason to it. So I want to tell you the things that I do know, the things that I'm absolutely certain about beyond any shadow of a doubt that God says to us very clearly and that James speaks over his church and, and that I want to speak over our church that I know are true uh, about sickness and healing and prayer in the Bible. The first is this, God still heals people. God still heals people. James 5, verses 14 and 15, if anyone among you is sick, let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of the faithful will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. It's interesting, you, you see almost certainty there from James. Certainty that, that if somebody is sick with a virus like COVID-19, what should we do? Uh, we should pray. We should pray for one another. Uh, you should call in and let the pastors pray for you. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Because we believe that God hears. We believe that God works. We believe that God saves and that God heals. And, and we don't always know why and we don't always know who and we don't always know how. Sometimes God heals. You go to the doctor, you get medicine and God heals you. Sometimes God heals in indescribable ways. Sometimes it takes years. Sometimes it's on the spot. I've seen all of them occur. I don't know that there's any rhyme or reason. This isn't science. This is God. That God does what he wants, when he wants, how he wants. But he does say, I still heal. And I want you to pray. 
I, I, I don't understand, to be honest with you, that there are, are some who would say that God, God doesn't do that anymore. I, I, I want to caution you uh, that that's not in the Bible. I want to caution you that God is still God, that God is still bigger than sickness and viruses and COVID-19 and COVID-20 and 21 and whatever else comes next. I, I don't want it to come. I don't want it to be here. There's fears connected to it, but God's bigger than all of those things and God still hears us and God still answers prayer and God still saves people and God still heals people and he calls us in no uncertain terms. If you're sick, pray, pray. And so God, God still heals. Listen, if you're experiencing symptom, symptoms and you're concerned, let's, let's pray. Let's pray for one another. And let's, let's trust God in the midst of this. Number two, uh, God is concerned about my soul. God's concerned about my physical body and God's concerned about my soul. James 5, 15 and 16. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you might be healed. The prayer of the righteous person has great power as it is working. James starts out with physical sickness, and then he goes to spiritual sickness. That, that some of us, you know, we're worried right now about physical sickness and, and physical viruses, but, but in the midst of this, we ought to also just look at the state of our souls and say, are there areas that, that I'm sick spiritually? Are there sins that need to be forgiven spiritually? And then I, I do believe that there's a connection between the spiritual and the physical. I believe that God created us that way. And so James says, when somebody is sick, I want you to pray for their physical body and I want you to pray for their spiritual body as well. I want you to pray that they would, what's the word he uses? Be healed. And here's what I know. I know that God heals physically and I know that God heals spiritually. And I know that God says beyond a shadow of a doubt, the way that we invite God to do those things is to ask him. The way that we invite God to heal us physically is to ask him. The Bible says, some of you, you don't have it because you, you, you haven't asked. You've been on social media, you're watching CNN or MSNBC or Fox News or BBC or Al Jazeera or whatever you watch, right? And you're, you're getting all your research and all your information and what you're going to do and the herbs you're going to take and the vitamins and all those kind of things. We just haven't asked God. Would you protect me? You haven't asked God, would you heal me? And I, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, God heals physically. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God heals spiritually. God healed me spiritually when I was 16 years old. And I came to him as a religious, sick teenager. And I said, I don't really understand how this all works, but I know that I need someone to heal me. I know you need me. To, I know you, you want to heal me. I know you can heal me. And I want you to, I want, you to, I want you to heal me. I want you to make me whole. I want you to make me well. <laughs> and I know that God still heals physically and spiritually. And he's as concerned about my physical well-being as he is my spiritual well-being. And so James says, when it comes to sickness, ask God to heal. Ask God to heal. Number three, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God wants to grow me in my faith. James used the, uses the example in James 5, 17 and 18. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. In other words, he's just a normal dude. He, he's just a normal guy. There's nothing overly fantastic or supernatural about Elijah. Just a dude, a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. James says, there's this dude, Elijah, nothing really special about him. And he prayed fervently for it to not rain, and God heard, and it didn't rain on the earth for three and a half years. And then he prayed again, <laughs> and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. You know, when I, Elijah prayed that prayer, God was using Elijah's life to, to confront a sinful regime. Ahab was the king at the time, and, and Elijah was making a statement of the power of God to Ahab, but do you know that God was making a statement of his power to Elijah? That, that there are times that things are going on and I'm praying prayers and, and God <coughs> is trying to do something as much in my heart as he is the one I'm praying for. God wants to grow you in your faith. God wants to be glorified in your life. This, this prayer that, that Elijah prayed was, yes, to exhibit the power of God to King Ahab, but it was also to exhibit the power of God to the prophet Elijah. Listen, there are things right now that, that I bet you're praying that you haven't prayed in a long time. 
There are things that I bet you're hoping for that you haven't thought about in a long time. Pressure, fear, anxiety has a way of making me pray differently. And can I tell you that as I pray those prayers, God's growing me. As I pray those prayers, God's changing my perspective, reminding my heart, showing himself strong and faithful. Can I tell you that we're in a season right now where we're praying different prayers and hopefully more prayers. And in the midst of it, I think God's going to show his power because God can and still does do those things. But God's also looking to grow the faith of this people, of Graceway. And so I want to encourage you in the midst of this, I want to encourage you to, to seek growing in your faith. Now, how does faith work? This is an important thing. How, how does faith work? Because it feels so squishy. It feels um, so subjective. It feels, I, I, don't, I don't really know how this works or, or how to go about it. So let me make it really easy for you. Number one, faith begins with God's word. Faith begins with God's word. Whenever Elijah prayed this prayer, God told him uh, what to pray and how to pray it. And, and Elijah was just taking God at his word. Can I tell you, there are things that God says about COVID-19 and the season that we're in that directly apply, and faith is, I believe you. I can't see it. I can't see it right now. Uh, I, don't, I don't feel it right now, uh, which is what makes it faith. If I can see it, uh, it stops being faith. It just starts being sight. But there are things that you're praying right now that haven't come to pass, that you're praying in, in faith. You're taking God at his word. Isaiah 55 and verse 11, so shall my word that goes out from my mouth, it will not return to me empty. It shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing to which I send it. I asked you last week, what are the things that God's trying to teach you in this season? What are the things that God's saying to you? What is the word of God to you, either from this book or in your time of prayer or conversation or a song that you heard that you know that God's saying certain things to you? You're going to believe him? You're going to take him at his word? Uh, that's faith. When I can't see it, when I don't feel it, when I'm afraid that it might not happen, to take God at his word uh, is faith. That, that's, that's where faith begins. And then faith continues when I hold on to what he said. It, it begins when God speaks, and it continues when I hold on to what he said. Galatians 6 and verse 9, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap when? If we do not give up. So there are things that when I'm reading through my Bible reading plan, when I'm spending time with God, that God says to me that I feel like the Spirit of God applies to my heart in this season. Can I tell you, faith is to hear from God and to believe God. At that moment of revelation, faith continues then when I wake up the next morning and believe it again. <laughs> faith continues when I take that revelation and I hang on to it even when I develop a cough, even when I get bad news from the boss, even when um, fear and anxiety feel like they're getting the best of me. I'm not going to get weary in doing well. I'm going to hang on in faith to what God says, and I will reap in due season. I don't, when is that? I, I don't know. Let's be patient. Let's persevere. Let's praise God in the middle. I, I'm going to reap in due season uh, if I don't give up. When's this going to be over, man? When are we going to be able to get back to normal? I, I don't know. Be patient. Like a farmer, invest in what you can invest in to honor God. Persevere. Wake up tomorrow morning and take what God has said and believe it again. Praise God again. Uh, and this will come to an end. Listen to me. This will come to an end. But I want what God intends to grow in your life. I want you to bear, be able to bear the fruit of it. Uh, for it to exist even when this is over. This is going to come to an end. What is God trying to plant in your heart right now that when this is over, that fruit's still going to be there? It's still going to be there. And then lastly, faith, faith begins with God's word, continues when I hold on to it, and grows from small beginnings to a grand finale. Think about this, that there are things that God is going to plant in your heart that are going to shape who you are, that once the news stops and the virus is gone, that's still going to be there. There, there are things about you that are going to be strengthened, that are going to be grown, that are going to look more like Jesus, they are going to be more effectual, more fruit-bearing, bring more glory to God. Listen, there are going to be things that when I stand before God, I'm going to be glad that those things are there and they are going to have been brought to pass in this season. 
And so here's what the Bible says, Zechariah 4 and verse 10. Do not despise these small beginnings. That, that word you got from God, that thing that God taught you in the midst of this, don't despise small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. <laughs> the Lord rejoices to see what he's doing in your heart during this season. Doesn't feel big. It actually feels, let's be honest, it feels terrible. But God's doing something in your heart. He rejoices to see the work begin. He rejoices to teach you something new. He rejoices to make you something new. He rejoices to see what faith is going to form in your heart in this season that once the news is gone and peace is back and normalcy has returned, that you're going to be different because of what happened in your heart in faith in this season. And so here's the question. Here's the question. Uh, where do you need to be healed? Where do you need to be healed? I, I, I have no doubt that there are people who are watching this online service and you're not a follower of Jesus and, and this pressure right now is, is crushing to you. Can I tell you the reason isn't so you get stronger, get more money, hoard more stuff. The reason is for that pressure to bring you to a place uh, where you'll surrender and you'll say, God, I need healed. I need healed. I, I've talked to so many people who say, I, I don't know how to do that, so let me teach you, okay? I want, I want you to, to pray a prayer of spiritual healing that I prayed when I was 16 years old. It goes like this, God, I know, I know that I, that I failed you in so many ways. God, I know that I'm not who you've called me to be. God, I know that I can never be good enough, and I want you to know that I'm sorry. God, I know and God, I'm sorry. God, I confess, I agree with you that I need a Savior. I'm sorry that I've tried it my own way. I'm sorry that I've tried to be good enough. I'm sorry for the, the things that have happened and the things that I've done and the ways that I've fallen short. God, please forgive me. I know I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Because of Jesus, God, would you forgive me today? Because of Jesus, would you heal me today? Because of Jesus, would you make me new today? Because of Jesus, would you save me today? And as best as I know how, I give you my life. As best as I know how. Doesn't mean I don't still have questions. Doesn't mean everything goes away. Doesn't mean COVID evaporates into the air. But it means that that pressure that I'm feeling isn't yours to carry anymore. It's Jesus's. And he's up to it. And so some of you, man, I want to invite you in this season of physical fears to experience spiritual healing. Others view you're followers of Jesus, but you're sick. You're literally sick. Here's what I'd like you to do. I, we're going to make space for you to call in and talk to a pastor, and either by phone or by video. You'll see the number coming up uh, here at the end, um, and we want to pray for you. During this season, we can't be there with you physically, uh, but we believe that God hears us when we pray, even if it's if it's over an internet line. And so I'm asking you to ask for help. I'm asking you to let us know. I'm asking you to let us, would you let us pray for you in this season? I know you're praying. We want to pray for you. We want to pray for what's going on in your physical body and in your emotional body and in your, re, your relational body. But we're going to set up times for you to just be able to call in and our pastors are going to be available. And, and we want to do what James tells us to do. If you're sick, the call if you're sick, call the elders, call the pastors, and let us pray for you. And we believe that God still heals. Amen? Come on, somebody. We believe that God still heals. We believe that God's bigger than this. We also believe that God wants us to ask. And so I'm asking you, if you're spiritually sick, will you receive healing today? I'm asking you, if you're physically sick, will you let us pray for you today? Call the number. Let us pray for you. We'll set up a video chat. We'll talk to you on the phone. Man, I'd love to come to your house and pray for you. I'm not able to do that right now, but we believe that God hears and answers and still does this. And so we want to see in faith what God's going to do. You know, we began the book of James now nine weeks ago. And it's funny, sometimes whenever we name series, <clears throat> there's a lot of different reasons. This one, I I felt very clearly that we were supposed to name this Everyday Faith, and I had no idea at the time that we would be in this season when we finished. Everyday Faith was more of a concept when we started this series than it is now. Now it's a, 
It's a necessary reality, isn't it? For us to trust God again and again and again. For us to move out of conceptual, ideological faith and into practical and actionable faith. I want to ask you, what's God saying to you? What's God planting in you? What's God calling you into in this season? What better opportunity for you to live out your faith, to ask God things you haven't asked him in a while, to hear from God in ways you haven't heard him in a while, to believe God in ways you haven't believed him in a while, to obey God in ways you haven't obeyed him in a while. And like that farmer, to plant, plant seeds that in due season, if you don't give up, you'll reap. I can't tell you how much I miss you. I'm sitting in this <laughs> dark and empty auditorium. I, I came in here early this week and was really just dreaming about the day that we're going to come back and I think we're going to rip the roof off this place, don't you? We're going to have an outburst of worship <laughs> from all this pent-up pressure. But can I tell you, God wants to be faithful to you, not just on that day, in this day and tomorrow. And so I want to ask you to trust him. I want to ask you to call out to him. I want to ask you to lean into him. I want you to know I love you so much. I'm praying for you with everything that I know how. And by God's grace, we're going to see each other soon with some new stories of what God has done. Amen. Let me pray for you. God, we're in a unique season right now. And in many ways, God, we're under pressure. We're afraid. We're scared. This is now a month. This is our fourth Sunday. And God, if this is teaching us anything, it's teaching us our fragility. It's teaching us how little control that we have. And I, and I hope that in the midst of this, God, we're calling out to you. In the midst of this, God, we're praying new prayers. We're believing again. We're trusting anew. And I'm asking you, God, that you would be healing in all of the ways that you know that we're broken, that you would be saving people today, that you would be healing people who don't even know that they have the virus and people that know that they do that you would be protecting God. God, all of the things that are on our hearts we bring to you right now, saying that you're bigger than our problems, you're bigger than this virus, you're bigger than the loss of a job, and we want to trust you again. We're taking you at your word. And so would you save, and would you provide, and would you protect, and would you heal, God? And when we are able to come into this room, God, would you give us stories of your faithfulness that don't just shape this season, but shape our our church, and our lives in this generation for your glory and our joy. We love you, God. We love you because you loved us first. God, protect this church and bless this church and lead this church, and we thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, the only name that matters, we love you. Amen. I love you. I'll see you soon.